Welcome to C3 In This Together, 30 Minutes in Our Own Voice, a mental health and suicide awareness series. In honor of September being Suicide Awareness Month, we will hear from someone with a lived experience who's coping, managing, and navigating mental health and suicide. My hope throughout this series is that together, we will be the generation that ends the silence, the shame, and the stigma that surrounds mental health and suicide. Today, I'm so honored our guest is David Kendrick. David is a combat veteran, an author, founder of Lion Speaking Agency, and vice president of the DCAB chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, this man is a wealth of resource. You're going to be inspired by his story. I'm so glad, uh, David, that you've taken the time to be a part of our series. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Very excited. Thank you. Well, thank you again, my friend. Well, let's jump right in. Um, feel free to tell us a little bit more about yourself. And then if we can uh, move right into our, our first question, which is tell us your story. So again, tell us a little bit more than what I've said about uh, who you are. And then if you would take some time to tell us your story. All right. Well, the story of David Kendrick starts on April 20th, 1987, uh, born in Rochester, New York, and from uh, lived in the city and moved out to the suburbs with my dad and uh, around 2005, I was a senior in high school. Didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I always say that I was better at football than I was at school. And, uh, you know, you stated earlier from Buffalo, I, I wanted to play football for the University of Buffalo and then get drafted for the Buffalo Bills, to the Buffalo Bills. And that didn't happen. So it's, it got time for you to get serious and decide what I really wanted to do with my life. So one day, riding home from school, uh, I saw a big building with the sign US, United States Army, be all you can be. I walked in. Hey, I want to join the Army, and I want the most exciting job that y'all have. And that's when I became a Calvary Scout. A uh, little known fact about Calvary Scouts, uh, if you know who the Buffalo Soldiers are in the 1800s, it was an all-Black mounted Calvary unit riding in on horses, and that's where the term calling the Calvary comes from. I joined the Army at 18 years old in 2005, went to Iraq in 2006 at the age of 19, and June 17, 2007, at 20 years old, I was shot in both legs by a sniper during an ambush. Uh, life got crazy for me. After that, um, it, the bullet shattered my femur, hit my femoral artery and caused severe nerve damage. I was left permanently disabled. I was able to keep both my legs. Uh, three years of physical therapy, over 15 surgeries. Got out the army in 2010 due to the injuries. Moved back home to Rochester and just struggled with mental illness, PTSD, uh, attempted suicide, drinking myself to sleep every day. Uh, and then I got educated. I moved to Atlanta in 2012 and got my bachelor's degree in business with a concentration in entrepreneurship and eventually moved on to get my master's degree with a concentration in project management. And I just started my own business, Lion Speaking Agency, and now I work as an advocate for those suffering from mental illness, especially here in DeKalb County. Found out about NAMI and... Uh, Put my hat, put my name in the in the running to be vice president, and was voted on as vice president, and it's been a blast ever since. Wow, what an inspiring story of hope, recovery, redemption, and really letting folks know that regardless of your experience, you can overcome. And, and David, uh, we're seeing that here. You're a living testimony, uh, just a living, uh, breathing uh, miracle. Uh, letting us all know that regardless of our story, uh, we can be overcomers and be resilient. Thank you for that. Uh, tell us some more um, about your experiences, uh, having been uh, in the Army and, of course, uh, serving uh, in the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Uh, tell us uh, some of your experiences surrounding mental health and suicide. Additionally, we know that currently there's a lot being said about the military. 
while we're not going to use this platform to address decisions surrounding military deployment, what do you want people to know about mental health and suicide among the military and the impact it has on your families? Okay. The last report that I saw from the VA stated that 17 veterans a day die from suicide. Now, I deployed to Iraq in 2006, and our deployment went from 2006 to 2008. The year in between, 2007, was documented by the New York Times as the bloodiest year of the war. That's when we seen the most action, and we we had a lot of soldiers like myself who were injured in the line of duty, and then others who were unfortunately killed in the line of duty. And where the mental illness comes from is just all that combat, all that trauma. Like the day after I got shot, my best friend, my roommate, Eric Lamar Snell, he was shot and killed. And I was laying in the hospital. And once I found that out, I had survivor's guilt because my best friend, he had children and I didn't. So here I am am laying in bed, injured, but wishing that I was dead. And so my friend could live because he had children to get home to. And I, and I did it. And I still don't Uh, going to war. It's an experience. Unlike anything that you, the movies doesn't, it don't give it justice. The things that we see, the, the bonds that we make, but most importantly, the, what we come home with, it can't be unpacked. And with my injury, it's going to be a lifelong recovery, both physically and mentally. Because there's some things that you can't get over. For my example, I was shot by a sniper. I didn't know who who injured me. I couldn't put a face on whoever injured me, right? And so I live with this constant fear that the sniper is still out there waiting to finish the job that he started in 2007. How realistic is that? Not realistic at all. Probably 0% chance that's going to happen. But in my mind, I have this scenario that I can't get rid of that on that day, he didn't shoot to kill me. He shot to wound me so that later on in life, when I'm enjoying life and fulfilling all of my goals that I want to, he can come finish a job. And that's just, that's just this scenario I have in my head. And there's many other veterans who have scenarios like that in their minds as well especially those veterans who have deployed over and over and over again over the last 20 years. Wow, thank you for sharing. And and let me say this, and so often those of us who have not been to war, we've not enlisted, uh, we don't understand the full impact of what you and so many other veterans have done. And we can't uh, communicate and put into words uh, as, as we should, But let me pause right here and say to you as as heartfelt as I can, thank you for serving our country. Thank you and so many others uh, for giving of your life. And uh, you've said it, uh, for some, this will be a lifetime journey surrounding uh, mental health awareness and mental illness and uh, living with some of what you're living with. But thank you on behalf of the public, those of us who will never fully understand, and many of you veterans who are watching, uh, please hear as much as we can communicate. Uh, We don't have the right words. We don't have the right framework, uh, but many of us and so many of us want to communicate again to you. Thank you for the life that you have given in service and that you continue to give. uh, Thank you. our nation. We, We certainly appreciate you. What would you say to someone or a loved one who has been impacted by suicide, a survivor, or maybe someone who may have suicidal ideations. So again, that's kind of a threefold question right there, right? Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone or uh, a family member who's been impacted by suicide or mental illness? Uh, Maybe someone who has been a survivor. Uh, And then uh, we may have some who may be thinking about who have suicidal ideations. What would you say to them, David? Life goes on. Life gets life gets better. Um, w- when I was injured, you know, f- one of the first things that my mom said to me, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Mm-hmm. When I got home, I dealt with a lot of different things. And my mom didn't know how to react. She didn't know exactly what to say. She didn't know what she was seeing because I was the first person in our family to join the military. 
And one thing that I'll never forget, um, one night I got really drunk. I didn't feel like living at all. So I put a bunch of pills and a bottle of Bacardi. I drank it all and I drove myself to the hospital. And I didn't want to talk to anyone. I just wrote a note at the front gate saying, hey, I'm highly suicidal. This is what I just did. Hopefully you guys can save my life. I got to the hospital and I blacked out. And when I woke up, I was in this room and my mom was there. And just the look on her face is something that I'll never, ever, ever forget. And even though it was a failed attempt at a suicide, because I could have black died on the way to the to the hospital because I was so drunk and just didn't want to live. And I seen that I seen the look in my mom's eyes and I thought, I can't do this to my mom. I can't, especially not after surviving getting injured. And then after that, me and my mom built this really, really close relationship. She took me to church and we started singing together in church and our our bond became really close. Um, so th that life does go on after a failed attempt. Um, if you know someone who does, who has committed suicide, what you can do is reach out to others. Because the reason I started my business is because this is my therapy talking about it because it's it's it takes a lot of bravery to get up and spill your guts and talk about your deepest darkest fears but you never know you never 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 know who in your audience will be inspired or who is thinking about attempting a suicide and say okay i just heard david's story i don't want my mom to go through that i don't want to go through that i don't want to put any of my loved ones through that because it's the people that you are closest to that are hurt from your suicide. So together, life goes on with you, the people that you love the most, and, and the stories that you tell after you've experienced something like that. Wow, thank you for sharing. Uh, and let me say this, David, uh, I am so glad, we are so glad that you stayed. And I wanna say that again, mm -hmm. we are so glad that you stayed. And we want you to know uh, that we value you, we hear you, we see you. Uh, thank you for uh, continuing to stay and share your story. And you said it uh, so correctly, David, that uh, so many people are going to be inspired by your story. And I believe firmly uh, that someone or many people watching who may be thinking about taking their life by suicide, they're going to hear your story and they're going to make the decision to stay. And I want to say that to someone that's listening. Maybe you find yourself uh, in, a, in a dark place, and David has shared his story. Uh, you find yourself in a dark place. Please know that we're coming into that dark place with you. And what we want to do is we want to turn on the lights, and we want to let you know that we see you, we hear you, we value you, and we want you to stay. Uh, the world needs you. Uh, these dark times, we need you to stay. So someone listening, please hear us. Please hear Dave, David's story. Uh, please hear us from this series. This series is, is more than just um, uh, a series. This is an opportunity uh, for you to hear how much you are needed in this time. Uh, David, for our next question, what do you want people to know about managing our mental health? It's day by day, a day at a time one day at a time. You know, I said earlier that I'm still recovering physically and mentally from my injury in Iraq because I still have some days where I don't feel like being here. Uh, we talked earlier with the, the connection that we have, you from Buffalo, me from Rochester. I had to leave home because of this injury that I had because I have nerve damage in my leg and I have a titanium rod in my left leg. And thankfully in Atlanta, it doesn't get as cold as it does in, in Rochester. But I have to manage my mental health day by day. And uh, when I was a member of Toastmasters, I used to, I had a speech that I gave called uh, Mental Health Millionaires mm -hmm. and keep people around you that are mentally so healthy that they have, they have millions of mental currency to give to you. Somebody who's always cheerful, somebody who's almost so cheerful, it gets on your nerves, it makes you sick. Wow. You can only take it in, in small doses at a time. But those are people who are gonna be so cheerful no matter what you're going through in your life, just hearing them speak or just being around them, it's going to bring you out of your funk because your mental health, sometimes being around other people, 
it can be contagious. Wow. And if you're sad, that can bleed into somebody else's mood. And then what happens when two people get sad, they they get drunk together. That's when those negative, those negative thoughts creep into our minds. And that term liquid courage, it gives it also gives people courage to try to commit suicide like I did. So to try to manage your mental health day by day, stay around people who are happy, stay motivated. Most importantly, what I do, look at where you were compared to look at where you are now and look at where you're going. Because I tell you what, every day I wake up now, I'm excited about something else. Yes, yes. Like I, earlier this morning, I just spoke with a representative from the Cab County Schools about a program that we're trying to bring to the Cab County. Earlier this week, I talked to the police department in, Sh- in Shambly about bringing NAMI home front here to the Cab County to help other veterans. And I used to be in a place where I didn't want to live anymore. Now I can't wait to go to sleep and wake up the next day so I can have conversations with great people like you. Uh-huh. So managing that mental health, it, it's day, it's a challenge day by day. So keep you a mental health millionaire in your pocket. Hey, have that phone call with them. Just say, hey, I want to talk because that, that positive energy is, is contagious. Wow, David, I am I'm telling you right now, I'm stealing it from you. Mental health millionaires. I don't know if I'm gonna give you credit. I don't know if I'm gonna I'm gonna plagiarize, but I am taking that and I am running with that. Keep you some mental health millionaires. They so got they got it. enough mental currency to give to you and still oh. be very mentally wealthy. I'm telling you, it works. Oh my goodness, man, that just resonated with me. Did you hear that, my friends? Keep you or have around you some mental health millionaires that have so much currency that they can deposit in you that they can be healthy themselves and you can uh, receive of that uh, that 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 currency of health and wellness and hope. Man, that was powerful. And my friends, if you're watching, I want you to type that in the chat once this hits uh, social media. Uh, and make it clear that we need to have some mental health millionaires. That's the first time I'm hearing that. And like I said, I'm stealing it. Uh, it's now mine. Forget about you. <laughs> <laughs> Messing with you, my friend. But that really resonated with me. Well, as we begin to uh, wrap up our time together, uh, 30 minutes in our own voice, uh, a mental health and suicide awareness series. Uh, what do you want people to know about suicide awareness? And I also remember um, reading your story, uh, maybe um, in, in your book, which we'll mention in a little while, or in another presentation, you mentioned how you had the opportunity to step in uh, when one of your comrades uh, had thoughts of suicide. So tell us a little bit about suicide awareness. What do you want people to know about suicide awareness? Yeah, and- in our community, in the, in the veteran community, we, we deal with so much trauma, so much stress, so many, so much pressure, not only to be a provider to your family, but to defend the country. Mm-hmm. And now that 20 years of that combat is over, veterans have 20 years of trauma. Wow. It, to, even if you didn't deploy to Iraq or Afghanistan, you know somebody else who did, or you may know, you may even know a veteran who has committed suicide. And the thing, the thing about mental health and in the military, we call it the invisible war. It's, you can't see it. You can't see it. And sometimes people can put up a, a good front. And then the next thing you know, you're hearing about that they're in the hospital or they unfortunately have committed suicide. Um, it's, it's really hard to manage and what we can do as human beings, just be nice to people. And it's, it's so simple. You never know what you may say to someone or what you may do for someone that will walk them off the edge. Sometimes it's just lending a hand. There's just lending an ear. Just listen. A lot of people just want to be listened to some of the time. And I know here at NAMI, we provide a lot of programs for people who just want to be heard, peer-to-peer group, family-to-family. I'm looking to bring NAMI home front to the group so I can talk with other veterans because you never know what veteran you may talk to who is on the edge of suicide or who you may talk to who said, hey, man, you know, I had these plans, but talking to you, let me let me explain to you what I'm going through now. 
And with this current pandemic that we're living in now, people are feeling the pain emotionally, yeah. physically, mentally more than ever. Like people are burned out at work and feel like they can't make it, are struggling to live day by day. You never know what you can say to somebody that may save their lives. And, you know, people who I had someone come to me, a fellow veteran and say, hey, man, I've been going through this. I don't know how you did it. You so strong. I say, no, man, I'm 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 with you in that same boat. Sometimes sometimes I still feel suicidal as well. That's when I grab myself a mental health millionaire and, and say, hey, let's talk. Let's go out to coffee. Because mental health healing from that, for some people like myself, is going to be a lifelong journey. Wow. Lifelong. But I don't want anybody's mom to go through what my mom went through when she saw me in that house for the room that day. But the, the most important thing you can do when it comes to suicide prevention, be nice to people. Yes. Let them know where resources are available and find your lo your local NAMI because there's going to be, there may not be a David Kendrick there, but there may be, I don't know, a Steve Smith or, you know, a John there that you can talk to. Mm -hmm. So find out what resources are available to you and tap into them. Don't be, don't be embarrassed to let people know, Hey, I'm struggling. Wow. Well, thank you for that, David. I love that. Just be kind, right? There's a lot being said about suicide awareness and mental health awareness but really, uh, very simplistically, just be kind to people. Uh, and we know that empathy is getting down in the dark places with someone who's suffering and letting them know that they are not alone. So let's be uh, mental health uh, millionaires. Let's be people of empathy. Let's yeah. be people who give uh, other people opportunities to share their stories and be that safe place. Well, my friend, our time is coming to an end, but how can people reach out to you uh, and tell us about your organization? Also, uh, I want people to know about this amazing book that you have put out uh, sharing uh, your story. And David, I, I got me a copy because of course uh, I wanted to support uh, all of what you're doing and your work, but tell us how people can reach out to you. Tell us about your organization. And of course, okay. when they get a copy of this book. All right. So I am a professional speaker. Now that we're coming out of the pandemic, uh, the opportunities are opening back up. So you can find me at www.dkendrickjr.com or you can just come visit me right here on Facebook under my name, David Kendrick. Uh, for your local nom for, well, for uh, NAMI to Cap, you can visit our website, www.namitacab.org. If you would like to send me an email personally, my email address is vice president at namidecab.org. And we're always available. Somebody is always going to get back to you in a timely manner. And we're the things that we are doing in Nami the Cab, let me say, I am so excited. So, so, so excited for. I've never been so excited to work for an organization like Nami the Cab. And this is all volunteer based, all free, but this work that I'm doing now is so important, especially since I'm going to get trained in NAMI Homefront and help my fellow veterans. Because in the Army, we say, never leave a fallen comrade. Wow. Uh, thank you again. And of course, mention your book. Where can we? Yeah, Calvary, uh, available on Amazon. Um, this is a book about family, my friends, and me becoming a boy into a man in the battlefield, being exposed to a lot of different things in the military. And the reason I wrote this book, first of all, to tell my story, but coming out of this war, you don't have too many African-Americans that can tell you what it was like on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And um, not to say that the, all the other stories out there aren't good or aren't worth reading. However, my story is important too, because you don't have too many African-American veterans especially Purple Heart veterans like myself, who tell their stories because not too many African-Americans join up to do a dangerous job like I did. And it also pays homage to the Buffalo Soldiers of the 1800s. I know one thing I will say about the book, it is uh, the stuff people read in there. It may be shocking, but it's guys on the battlefield talking to one another. It's how the war really was, and it's how soldiers really are 
on the battlefield and uh, especially a, a group of young guys like me, because the story starts in Rochester with me being 17 years old. So a lot of people were like, wow, was it, it really like that for you? And uh, yeah, it was. Wow. Thank you again for your story. And thank you, David, for being a mental health millionaire. That's who you yeah. are. I'm telling you. Thank you for being light in these uh, very dark times. We so appreciate you. And again, I know so many people are going to be inspired. My friends, uh, we also want to let you know, if you or anyone that might be in crisis, uh, feel free. We want you to reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's a 24-hour crisis line. Uh, the telephone number will come up on the screen, 1-800-273-8255. Also, again, we want to personally invite you uh, for more resources, for more stories uh, like David, um, David's story, uh, for more resources surrounding mental health. I want to invite you to personally visit our website, which is c3inthistogether.com. That's going to come up on the screen as well. We also want to encourage you to take our 21-day thankfulness challenge as well as our next-gen hope challenge. Also, uh, many of you have been asking about our hope pill, right? That's available as well on our website. And this is a reminder to take your daily dose of hope. My friends, thank you again for joining us for this series. We hope to see you next time in another series, 30 Minutes in Our Own Voice. Again, David, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for the work that you're doing uh, in offering hope, healing, wellness, reducing the silence, the shame, and the stigma of mental health uh, and suicide. Thank you again, my friends, for joining us for 30 Minutes in Our Own Voice. And we hope to see you next time in another series. Bye. Bye.